Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this issue briefing. It's about uh, China. And also, uh, we know that last year, President Xi Jinping made a special address here, and the whole uh, world applauded. Uh, so this year, when we gather again in Davos, we are embracing a better world with synchronized recovery, both in the advanced economy and, and also in the emerging market, and in which China plays a big role there. And also, we know that China uh, had a 19th Party Congress uh, late last year, and according to our language, we entered into a new era. And also, um, aiming to play a robust role in the international affairs from economic, financial, and environmental front, China needs to tackle her own challenges at home while keeping the expectation of the whole world in mind. So in this issue briefing, we will define China's role as a new global power and also as a global contributor. So uh, we have a very small but a very uh, uh, powerful panel today. And to my uh, left, um, you must be uh, very familiar with him, and uh, Mr. Zhu Ning. He is the professor of the PBC School of the Finance, also associated dean of the National Institute of Financial Research of Tsinghua University. And uh, actually, this, um, you, this uh, institute and also this school is part of the PBOC. It's part of the PBOC, I should say that. And also to, to my right, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Carol Lee Rafferty, and uh, she is the managing director of the U University, also from, uh, from China. And uh, I, uh, I need to introduce that she is a, a YGL, the very um, most important uh, uh, participant of the uh, Winter Doubles. And as I uh, mentioned that China has entered into a new era. It is a, a Chinese way, but still it is very important. And the, uh, how do we elaborate the, uh, the new era? And the, uh, uh, the formal elaboration is that China has entered into uh, a time when the high quality of the development will be replaced, uh, when a higher economic growth will be replaced by the high quality development. At the same time, uh, uh, in, the, uh, 19th, uh, in the 19th Party Congress, there's a, a very interesting sentence saying that the, uh, uh, China uh, offered the whole world a new option for those countries who would like to um, uh, have a better and quick develop development while maintain its independence. So uh, according to my colleague in the World Bank, uh, they, they think that the whole world should be uh, shaken by this sentence, if not a, uh, shocked by this sentence. So I would like to uh, ask uh, both my colleagues here, what is your elaboration on the new era? And what is your elaboration on the uh, new option to the whole world? Maybe Ning first. Okay, I, I think I mean, for the new era, there are definitely a lot of uh, interpretations to that. Uh, I'll probably make three of my personal uh, uh, understanding. The first is, I think, as uh, Yin Chiyu have pointed out, uh, the priority of the economic growth is no longer put on the, the quant quantifiable growth uh, numbers. It's more about the quality or the resilience of the economy. So I think that's a very big shift from what we have been seeing for the past two or three decades. Uh, second, I think we have a far more inclusive goal for the development. And there has been a long standing uh, critique of China's growth model in terms of uh, I think China focused too much on growth but not development in a way of our goal has not been too uh, inclusive and we want to focus more on poverty relief, we want to focus more on uh, environmental protection. Those are the things which are not only important but also I think coming in very timely with China's uh, entering this uh, mid to high income uh, level country. So I think that is another big shift. The third one I think is not necessarily limited within the economic framework. I think it's more about a broader, as you mentioned on the second point, uh, is well, what we're trying to achieve with econ economic growth is to bring uh, the citizen of China and also maybe the citizen of the whole universe, uh, at least the whole earth, a, a better future, about a better opportunity to achieve or uh, accomplish whatever they want to accomplish. I think this is like a big shift of uh, uh, going from highly focused on growth to more inclusive uh, development goals and uh, from more China focused to a more global focused objective. Thank you. And Carol, what is your view on that? 
Well, um, today's topic is how is China leading the world? Um, I want to give a little context to my answer. Um, I head up Yale University Center in China. Um, Yale University, a place where both Ning and I graduated from, actually has a two centuries long partnership and engagement with the country. Um, we also have 100 plus partnerships, and that's why we've built an understanding of how the country has developed um, over the years. Um, the second thing I do is I'm also the co-founder of Lean In in China, which is a network of 100,000 young women covering 100 universities because in China. Because of the book of the Lean In? Yes, yes, inspired by Sheryl Sandberg's yeah. book. Um, and so um, what I'm going to say is I believe that China is leading the world in um, poverty alleviation and also innovations for inclusive growth. Um, why is that? Um, according to the World Bank, uh, over the past three decades, 700 million people uh, have been lifted out of poverty in China. Uh, that's more than twice the population of America. Um, and I believe that um, in the new era, millennials uh, are very much pioneering uh, the poverty alleviation efforts, not just government uh, and, bus and businesses. Um, I, wanted to, uh, I want to give two examples. Uh, the first example is uh, a fellow young global leader and also a Yale alumnus. His name is Qin Yuefei. Um, he has a, a new program, a new venture called Surf for China. And it's pretty much a, an internal Peace Corps where he encourages uh, young university graduates, uh, and sort of, uh, instead of taking up uh, lucrative jobs, um, go to the villages, go to the most remote uh, rural villages in China to jumpstart the rural economy by um, creating new economic opportunities, um, creating new uh, enterprises, uh, innovations, whatnot. Um, the second example I want to um, bring forth, uh, it's about uh, women, women and empowerment. Um, one of um, our role models in the Lean in China network is uh, Cindy Mee from VIP Kid, uh, for example. Um, she is herself uh, in her mid-30s. Um, she's running uh, one of the unicorn companies in China, mm -hmm. and um, her company um, is an online education platform. Um, right now, she, um, they teach uh, English to uh, children in China through um, the online platform with AI um, and all, all these other tools. And basically, she, um, the company now employs 40,000 teachers in North America, uh, many of whom are actually stay-at-home moms who have previously um, not been able to find jobs. Um, and I think um, these innovative uses of technology is not only creating growth in China, but for the rest of the world. Yeah. So very good stories from China and from mm -hmm. our colleagues who uh, take the leading role. Right. But uh, it's a micro level. We have a lot of the uh, individuals can do a very good thing to, to lead. But at the same time, as a macro level, as a national level, do you think that China is ready to lead the world? Ning? Yes, I think China is definitely getting there. I think, I mean, you're definitely right in, in the sense that I think I'm always puzzled by when I'm looking at China's economy. If you look at things from top down or if you look at things from bottom up, you've got two different countries. Yeah. So in some sense, I think uh, China is getting there in a way of the, the size, the sheer size of China's economy and China's population is making it the, just the, the leader of uh, many different fields of the economy or the business world. Uh, I will give you one example. One is the, 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 the cons consumer side. Mm -hmm. I think there are so many large multiple uh, multi-country uh, corporations. Uh, they have different sorts of needs and uh, complaints about Chinese market, mm -hmm. but then they also see the, the, the huge potential, the, the growing middle income class, which is creating like the largest uh, consumer market in the, in the world. And that's setting the trend. I mean, whatever Chinese consumers want, I mean, unfortunately or fortunately, well, the, the com companies around the world, they would have to conform to Chinese taste. And in, on a more higher up level, I think it's about, not just about China, I think China is to lead, but not to lead, I guess, the more developed country. China is more of a representative of the entire emerging economy. I think we're seeing China is being on the forefront of, I mean, in terms of multilateral uh, national, uh, national organizations in terms of the uh, financial institutions, in terms of how to set up a new economic or new financial orders for maybe not 
the largest economies in the world, but the, the, the fastest growing economy in the world. So I think that is where China is putting its interest uh, together with m the interests of many other countries in the similar, or it's like China 20, 30 years ago. So I think that is the trend which China is geared itself into. So I think that is when China is growing bigger, stronger, and also the Chinese market is growing more and more attractive, that naturally paves its way for China to lead the country, uh, lead the world uh, so, through its so own actions. It seems to me that your uh, uh, comment uh, just echo the, uh, the the sentence in the uh, uh, 19th Party's Congress, which is the uh, we offer the world a new option. Am I right? Well, it really depends on. <laughs> well, it's definitely a, a new option. I mean, I think China is uh, setting itself itself up as an example in so many different ways. I mean, in one way. We economists have been having a very difficult time trying to rationalize or explain why China has been achieving its economic growth miracle in the past three and a half decades. And in some sense, we have to scratch our heads and say, was well, there something wrong with the existing economic theory? Uh, so I think in that sense, it is a new path. It is a new option. The question is, I guess, the following twofold. One is whether this is an option which can be easily or reasonably easily replicated by other countries. Do you think one bell, one road is a good way to, uh, to offer the world this new option? I think it is a great initiative. And as President Xi pointed out, I think it is one way to tie all the population around the globe together in one big mission. Uh, I think it is also very important that we are both culturally and economically ready to do something like that. But the scale, the sheer scale, and the size of the, the, the initiative, it, I think it is destined to have to be carried out one step by another and one, uh, one, one thing after another. So I think it is a big initiative to what extent uh, many of the things that has been mentioned can be achieved in the next five to 10 years. I think that is a real question. I think that the devils are more in the details, more in the implementations. Yeah, thank you. And Carol, uh, you offered us a lot of good examples of the uh, individual and young individuals and uh, uh, women individuals in China. Uh, in terms of the uh, gender uh, issue, do you think that China can lead the world? Absolutely. Um, at uh, Lean in China, we do um, an annual survey to see what women want uh, in their careers, um, in their uh, family, in their development. Um, we also reference to the World Economics uh, Forum's uh, gender gap report. Uh, what we're finding in that um, is that China is actually leading uh, the world in terms of the number of women in STEM professions. Um, and I, I think that's really remarkable. Um, it's because of um, the emphasis of math and sciences in our um, basic education um, and the um, participation of men and women and young girls and young boys um, in those uh, very excellent um, programs. Um, our, our PISA scores uh, show that. So I actually think um, that is a model that um, other countries may seek to um, emulate um, in terms of, you know, why, why is it that in China, in, um, at uh, an Alibaba, JD.com, Baidu, Tencent, actually you would see um, almost an equal number of uh, engineers and founders and partners who are women. And I think that's, a, that's really remarkable. Yeah, that's good. And also, uh, because China is big, Mm -hmm. And in the big cities and the first higher cities, women can have a very equal right with their, their, uh, their um, um, male uh, colleagues. But in the hinterland and in the rural area, yes. maybe the situation is totally different. It so is. what should we do to, to cope this situation? Well, what we're learning is that, um, for example, through the Surf for China program, um, the uh, 300 million people in the rural population are mostly um, elderly and children, a lot of them um, female. So actually, through the Surf for China efforts, um, we're trying to create um, programs that enable them to have economic opportunities and with the use of technology and e-commerce, um, sell their products and services to a much wider market than before. Because we uh, want to uh, invite you to join us for the discussion, so I will very, um, I will move very quickly to ask you uh, some questions and allow you to join us for the debate. The first about economic growth. Uh, actually, uh, the economic growth in 2017 is a little bit more than expected. 
uh, which is uh, around 6.9%, which is much higher than a lot of the people's expectations. And also, the IMF had just revised up the uh, economic growth in China this year and also next year. So do you agree with the IMF that the, in this year, China will grow at 6.6%? I think so. I think, I mean, we, I think we're going to see a little a, bit A little higher or a little lower? Maybe a little bit lower. A little lower. Yeah. I think the, the, the reason is I think the economic growth that we enjoyed in 2017 largely comes from, part, partly coming from the devaluation of RMB, which is a boost to the uh, foreign export, and partly coming from the, the lingering effect of the wealth effect. Actually, this year, uh, RMB is appreciating, actually. Right, so that is why we're, we're going to lose some of the, the boost from yeah. the, the devaluation yeah. from the previous year. Uh, the second is, I think, the lingering effect of the wealth effect from the, the housing market boom in 2016, which is probably going to be moderating as well. So I think we're going to see a little bit of moderation in economic growth. But then uh, from the bottom up, I think you really see a lot of very vibrant entrepreneurial activities. You're seeing the economy growing up. You're also seeing some of the infrastructure investment we've made five, maybe ten years ago is now finally paving its way to, uh, to bearing fruits. So I think we're, we're going to see a gentle slowdown, but I think it's still, still, still going to be good enough for us to uh, achieve the doubling GDP per capita income So you mean a 6.5? Yes. Exactly. Yep, you'll, you'll be on that. Well, I think Neng is the expert on the uh, quantitative numbers, but um, I think... <laughs> yeah, on <what>, quality. <laughs> on quality, I think. Uh, what I would like to add is um, in terms of inclusive growth, um, kind of the, the two pillars I mentioned um, in the rural areas um, and also for um, kind of... Uh, in, in the area of gender, um, I think it would be um, both a challenge and a, an opportunity um, to have inclusive growth in all areas. And as you know, China is such a vast place. Um, so I, I always see that as, you know, probably, um, you know, there will need to be massive investments of resources and you may not be able to see the returns right away. Um, but I think over time, um, I believe that, you know, we will be able to eradicate extreme poverty by 2020 and move forward. Yeah, then the risks in your mind. Right. I think uh, the, the, the risks are probably twofold. One is, uh, well, I, th I think I'm, I'm very relieved to see that the, both the Parties Congress and the Central Economic Working Conference is putting preventing, preventing systematic financial risks at the top priority of the working policies. I think I mean, it is attracting enough attention or it's due attention from the policymakers. Uh, if I have to point out, I think there are two things which I um, I'm a little bit concerned about one is still the debt problem, which is closely related with the asset bubble. So uh, it's, I think that the debt level itself is still under control. It's just the speed by which the debt has appreciated itself in the past five, six years. It is alarming. But I think China is already doing quite a bit on uh, containing the problem, trying to tighten up the, the regulation. And we saw a little reduction in the the debt to GDP level in 2017, which is the first in the past decade, which is very encouraging. So that's one level. The second is, I think, I'm a little bit concerned about how the, 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 the trade situation, the uh, geopolitical situation is going to put some uncertainty to China's export, which is still a very big part of China's economic contributor. So I think this is something I'm very uh, watchful about, what's happening with the uh, Korean Peninsula and what is happening with uh, President Trump's uh, policy about well, it's, it's retaliation or it's uh, uh, protection against China's uh, but you, uh, Are you expecting a trade war between the China and the United States? I don't think there will be a full front uh, trade war, but I think we will see conflicts rising up uh, here and we, there. We and have seen a 30% of the tariff <laughs> for the year. Uh, pre precisely. I think yeah. There might be a little bit of tick for tack uh, going from both sides, but then I think the most constructive constructive way would be for both sides to sit down, talk calmly, and to have the issues work out. After all, trade should be a Pareto enhancing mechanism where both sides would benefit from. Risk? Um, I think uh, Ning described it very well. Um, I will focus on trade. Um, I believe that as um, other countries may be reviewing their bilateral and multilateral trade relationships, uh, there could be some um, interesting opportunities and challenges coming up, uh, especially with the United States. Um, however, I do feel that um, with the Belt and Road initiatives and China um, hoping to build um, more South-South co cooperation, um, and kind of um, a lot more diverse uh, trade relationships around the world um, in conjunction with building a very robust 
uh, domestic economy that's increasingly surface oriented. Um, I do feel that um, it's an era of challenges and opportunities um, where um, we should see whether um, and how the country pivots um, in terms of uh, changing the quality and the direction of its economic growth. Now, very quickly before I open the floor, uh, do you think that China can lead the world uh, in a way that is a, uh, um, it's an authoritative way of the government? And we can translate into a very effective and very efficient government, but it's uh, authoritarian. Do you think this is the way China can lead the world? I guess this is too qualitative, so I will leave this to a camera. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a very interesting question, because I would characterize Chinese government as meritocratic mm -hmm. um, at the foremost, okay. um, because um, I believe uh, it's a system of seniority, and uh, there are multiple voices, um, even for economic reform and where the direction of the country and the policy should go. So I think um, it's really a very sophistic uh, sophisticated no negotiation um, among different parties, um, businesses, um, the people, um, as to you know, what is best for the country. So I would say that um, it's actually a very interesting alternative uh, to uh, what's prevailing in the world these days. Yeah, it's something yeah, different. Actually, and something really quick. And also, I think there's a difference between the Western and the Eastern culture in yeah. a way that how yeah. government is perceived by its population. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. Any questions from you? Yeah, yes, please, gentlemen. Please identify who you are and uh, a question. Thank you. Uh, Ishan Theroux at the Washington Post. Uh, just quickly, just to rephrase the, the title of the panel, why would China want to lead the world? Uh, the, as, you, as you described, the, the incredible transformations, the upliftment of double the population of the U.S. from poverty has all taken place under an order guaranteed by the United States. Does China have very much interest in seeing that order shaken up or changed in any tangible way? And to return to the, the geopolitical question that, that has been briefly discussed, um, how, how real are the concerns in China about what the Trump administration may do or not do? Um, They've, especially in recent days, they've taken a pretty hostile stance towards Chinese trade policies, and, and that may be a sign of further tensions to come. So I, I welcome further thoughts. Any of you? <laughs> okay. I guess I've, uh, I've taken my uh, shout out. Okay. So I, I <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe we can collect more questions, and you can oh, respond later on. Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please. We collect all the questions. With Itai Media Group, I, I, I have actually one question relating to risk. Uh, although we enjoy like uh, synchronized global expansion, but one session called the next financial crisis actually caught people's attention in this morning. There are actually three uh, major risks that are close to everyone's heart. One is the asset bubble and not only uh, the equity market, now the bubble also spread its tentacle to the crypto asset. And the second is uh, the risk in the banking sector, but most of them think the risk is cleared after several years of a very uh, a serious stringent regulation. And a third is- um, What is your yeah, question? China's, China's debt issue. So maybe, could you please maybe elaborate a little bit more on the three risks, which do you think is the most um, um, critical one? at a current juncture. Thank you. Yeah, please. There's a growing criticism of China. There's a growing criticism of China's protectionism in, and the difficult that it is for, for foreign companies to do business in China and that the protectionism has not changed uh, beyond some promises by your leader. So how, how do you see? Do you see that changing? You see I'm, I'm more open and more competitive market for foreign companies? Yeah, very good question. Thank you. Please. Markus Preis, ARD, German TV. Um, since Davos is also about sharing perspectives, what is your perspective on Europe and the US? What are their problems and could they be overcome? Thanks. OK. Yeah, please. Doc Burkhart, True News. My question is, what obstacles or what uh, problems do you foresee in the further expansion of the One Belt Initiative over the next 10 to 25 years? 
Yeah, thank you very much. So very good questions, and you see, I uh, uh, give you, and you can uh, choose anyone. <laughs> you can choose any questions you want to respond. Okay, may, may I pick uh, Eileen's question on, uh, on uh, uh, bubble? Because I, after I wrote this book called, titled China's Guaranteed Bubble uh, last year, so, uh, well, I, th I think that's a, that's a serious uh, risk. And I'm very glad to see the policymakers have been uh, putting a lot of emphasis on preventing that risk from uh, materializing in the past year. Uh, if I have to uh, sing out one thing which I think is going to be very beneficial in tapering off the bubble or preventing the bubble from bursting is, uh, as my book mentioned, uh, the guarantee. I think there's a lot of implicit guarantees in China's economy, ranging from central government to lower level of government and then going to the private sector. So a lot of investors, corporations, and even governments believe they don't have to take responsibility for the risks they have taken. They're only thinking about making money from investment, not having to take up the consequences. So I think it is I mean, the, the, the center theme of the risks, part of the reason why we're seeing so much speculation in uh, ranging from housing market to the, 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 uh, uh, the, the trust company products to some of the cryptocurrency is the investors believe if there's something there's something troubling, the government will eventually come out and bail them out. I think the government would have to uh, establish a credible threat in a way that investors, corporations, they have to take responsibilities for their own risk taking. So I think that is the key to preventing uh, risk from keeping uh, building up. So first take this one. Um, I'll, I'll make an unusual attempt to try to answer all the <laughs> questions all in my stuff. own way. You will catch up. Um, which is that I actually think that... But be very common, brave. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, a common problem among Europe, US, China um, is the um, quantitative easing that actually happened in the last financial crises, which created all these um, asset bubbles and legacy issues that we're all, exper all, all experiencing. Um, and I think this is a big challenge because um, in the new era, um, the um, biggest objective is actually to um, have everyone uh, pursue a happy and productive and meaningful life. And I think that is the purpose of all governments, whether US, Europe, developing countries, Africa, um, you name it. Um, and I, so I actually see that um, as one of the challenges that we're all commonly facing um, in this era. And um, I believe my interpretation of the topic of this talk is uh, where is China leading the world? And maybe not necessarily um, why does China want to lead the world? But I do think that China um, does provide a valuable voice and perspective and perhaps alternative to some of the solutions uh, to some of the most um, pressing issues that we're all facing. Do you want to talk a little bit about the doing business environment in China? Yeah, I think. Oh, doing business yeah. um, by foreign companies. Yeah. Um, it's a very interesting question because um, I understand that uh, many of the chambers of commerce have actually um, kind of pointed out these problems uh, in China in their <coughs> recent surveys, uh, business climate reports. Um, and I would say that um, the Chinese government in various areas have listened. Um, and, uh, for example, with the financial services area, um, this year there have been uh, new openings um, and new uh, promises in terms of uh, you know, reciprocity and honoring the, um, these uh, principles. So I think, um, I think it will be a very interesting environment uh, going into 2018 and beyond. Yeah. May I just add a couple of things? One is regarding the uh, multinational companies. I think the, well, that there's one thing that's worth taking a look, that is, I think Chinese investors, Chinese consumers are different in their preferences. So in some sense, I think it's partly it's probably the business environment, and partly it's the foreign companies that have not been very successful in understanding the, the, the needs or the preferences of Chinese uh, consumers. So I think that is, there's just both, both the pull and the push side of the, of the reality. And going back to the question uh, by our friend from uh, Washington Post, I think I, I tend to uh, echo what uh, Carol just said. I think it's not necessarily about why China wants to live. Sometimes it's uh, more of a, uh, a natural outcome of the, the size or the development of one economy as what has happened to the US like 150 years ago. So that's one thing. The second is I think it's not just about China. I think we have, uh, we'll, we'll have the BRICS countries, we have uh, the, 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 the mint countries, we have a lot of the emerging economies which have similar needs at different stage of their development 
period. So I think that's more of a representation of a larger group or larger block of countries against the existing uh, the, the financial orders or the economic orders of the, of, of the world, I think. And when the Belt and Road? Oh, the, the, the Belt and Road, yeah. I think actually it's not just China's challenge. I think it's probably the challenge to many countries uh, around the world. Uh, I, I can think of three things. One is terrorism. I mean, the, the, just the security, very basic security reasons. I mean, China is facing those challenges in its construction projects. It doesn't mean that other countries are not facing similar problems in other aspects. So I think that that is one thing. The second is, I think, the, the, the financing, particularly financing for public projects. I think that is one challenge which President Xi highlighted in last year's G20 meeting about the, the, the more active fiscal policy. But then the question is, where does the money come from? So I think that's, uh, that's one challenge not only for China, but for many other countries uh, along the Belt and Road Initiative. The last one is, I think, uh, also a very broader question, uh, wealth distribution or re redistribution. I think it's, uh, I mean, it is happening in the U.S. as well. It is happening along many of the not so wealthy countries along the Belt and Road Initiative. That is, how can we have more inclusive growth? How can we have people appreciate what we have been building? Yeah, and also a uh, very hostile uh, trade policy from the United States. And will we, China and United States, end up in the Sioux trap? Finally, at the end of the day. Well, there's, um, I believe there's a debate about whether it's a, the Thucydides trap or the Kindleberger trap or <laughs> a lot um, of trap. the many other traps. Um, and I think the trap is really um, just talking about the trap itself because um, a trap by itself means that um, if you're smart, you can um, recognize what it is and avoid it. And I believe that... Can we circumvent the, the trap? <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe that, at least um, with the Chinese government, um, the Chinese government is prepared for um, any, any scenarios that will happen uh, geopolitically, economically, um, because uh, the Chinese government takes a very long-term strategic vision. Um, so, um, you know, it may be different in different co countries under different political systems, um, but I have confidence that um, leaders um, and leadership and also the people will be able to um, kind of voice their v wisdom and how to, and private actors, how to navigate um, these traps and get around them and t t uh, destroy these traps even. <laughs> destroy the trap. Yes. What about your <laughs> solution for the traps? Well, I think especially with a platform such as the World Economic Forum, I think they have ample opportunities to work out the differences. And I think yeah. the, the leaders around the, the, the globe are smart enough to see how, I guess, how, how, how flat the world has become and it's really in nobody's interest to have any kind of war or traps or, I mean, conflicts. Yeah, I think that we uh, have run off the time and the uh, time for us to wrap up. I would like to take the, uh, uh, the privilege of the moderator to ask you the final question. Uh, my question is like this. In 10 years' time, do you think which one will become the, uh, the next global uh, currency? RMB or Bitcoin? <laughs> A choice. I love this question. Um, I can't say both. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a competition between the two. Okay, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, I'll, I'll start. I would say neither. Neither. I think 10 years is probably too short for RMB to eventually uh, become the, the dominant yeah. global currency. Mm -hmm. But I but think the, the next. Uh, the, yeah, the next, I think it's, it's probably too soon. I mean, I, th I think it's going to happen, but two, I mean, a decade is probably too soon of a target. So how long? Uh, I so would say need. decades. I mean, if you look at the example of uh, the U.S. dollar, it has taken the U.S. dollar decades to replace sterling, become the dominant mm -hmm. uh, global currency. So I think we will get there, but it's a matter of time. Would you like uh, to predict the fate of the Bitcoin in <laughs> Yeah, I think time? that's less certain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> much less certain. Um, I would say that um, the RMB will become one of the major currencies, one of, together with USD. And, um, and Bitcoin could potentially become one of the major transactional um, stored, store of value as well, uh, depending on regulatory changes. Um, you, know, you know, whether it's going, like, who's going to use it? Who's using it, the, the, the exchange? So um, I think it will be a very interesting world that um, we and uh, our children will be living in. Yeah, thank you. We'll come back <laughs> 10 years later to yes. have a look at which, <laughs> which right. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so thank much you. for the panelists. And also thank you for you. Thank you.